dense uh, piece. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Okay, the title that I, I sent in the abstract uh, was was um, was different. I guess uh, I should apologize uh, because uh, if someone of you came to see something, maybe you think now I'm not talking about that. Uh, I'm still talking about something that is in the abstract that I proposed, but a subset of the things I want to talk about, and probably a bit more specific. And uh, I think that um, that's good because somehow uh, this is a good occasion for me to, to propose some open problem, something uh, technical to an audience of people that, uh, that enjoy technical things. Um, so, in fact, sorry about changing the, the, the topic of the talk. Now, the um, the idea that I would like to communicate is um, quite uh, quite straightforward. That there is a uh, substantial interplay between um, graph theory and combinatorial optimization, and a number of fundamental questions in quantum information. And in particular, I will uh, consider a specific topic which is a uh, graph theoretic parameter called Lovatz uh, theta function or Lovatz theta number or Lovatz number and it's a very interesting parameter that has been uh, introduced uh, uh, during the late 70s um, to quantify certain um, information theoretic uh, capacity that I will define during my talk and recently, in the last uh, couple of years, this parameter turned out to be very, very useful in uh, quantum mechanics, uh, in quantum information theory, still to quantify certain uh, information theoretic quantities, and in foundational quantum mechanics, in particular in non quantum structure. Let me go through the summary. So, first, I will uh, mention what is zero information theory. I feel that the start was started by, by Shannon in the 50s. It's about communication, classical communication, actually quantum communication, without allowing for errors. I will tell you about the law of the function. I will go into the quantum uh, setting. And I will try to uh, describe what type of mathematical tools are needed in order to, to study uh, the quantum version of zero information. And then I would like to talk about some non-local games and some non-contextuality um, ideas. So the talk is based on work done together with Rui uh, Yaoguan, Adam Capello, and Andreas Winter, uh, mostly. So uh, as I said, I, I think that it's good to have a talk with some technical things. Uh, you will see that it's very plain and there is one story is somehow easy to follow, but just uh, you will have to be patient to go through the definitions with me, but you will see that it's very linear and, uh, and easy to digest. Uh, I wonder if there is a pointer here that I can use, um, otherwise no problem. I start by, by defining what is uh, the, the main idea in a zero information theory. Uh, we have to start with, with what a channel is, in particular what a discrete memory restriction in channel is. This is just a stochastic matrix whose rows and columns are indexed by symbols of an alphabet. And if the IJ entry of this matrix is different than zero, then it means that the symbol um, i is received when just transmitted. Right? So, and, and two symbols, JK, are confusable if you see there are two um, columns, these metrics, mm, for which we have this column. Uh, 
Um, so meaning that you send the same symbol and you can receive different symbols. So uh, this is where the confusability idea comes from. Now, given a channel, you can always define a graph. Uh, where a graph is just a combination of objects, which are nodes um, that are connected with each other in some way. Um, where the, the nodes of the graph are set to the, to the symbols of my alphabet that I use. And there is an edge between two symbols if the two symbols are in fact confusing. So if this condition is so. And most of the definitions that I'm going to consider here are just absolutely standard in graph theory. For example, this one, an independent set. This is the the independent set it is a, a subset of, of the set of vertices, and the elements of the subset are vertices that are not connected with each other. They are non adjacent And the independent number small is the is the size of the largest independent set in the graph. And I can find the, the one shot zero capacity as uh, the maximum number of symbols that can be transmitted without confusion in a single use of the channel. And you see, since uh, the channel is just represented by the graph itself, it is simple to see that uh, by definition, indeed, two vertices are adjusting when they are confusable, the maximum number of, of symbols that can be sent without confusion correspond to the independence number of the graph. Now I put this logarithm here just for, just for notation. It's not so, as a fact, the, the maximum number of symbols that can be transmitted without confusion in one use of the channel is the independence number of the graph. And as we, we know well, this quantity here is not easy to compute. So, please uh, tell me if, if this is fine, if, uh, if you're all happy with these type of definitions, uh, and uh, please interrupt me anytime you have a question, whatever question is. Now, uh, I want to jump something completely different immediately and uh, remind us what uh, uh, caution packet sets are. But I would like to, to define this through some graph theoretic uh, machinery which are orthogonal representations. So I define as an orthogonal representation of graph and, and this definition goes back to Lovatz in 1979. Uh, an assignment of vectors I used Dirac notation, we are all familiar with that. Such that two vectors uh, have um, zero inner product, so they are orthogonal if and only if they form an edge. Right? Now, on the basis of this definition, I can consider some special type of graphs. In particular, I say that the graph G. Uh, with set of vertices partitioned into k clicks, uh, d clicks, no, sorry if I, uh, I use d and then I use k, so a click is just a subgraph that is maximally connected, so with maximum number of edges. A complete subgraph, in fact, of all size uh, d. Um, now, I, I consider graphs such that the set of vertices can be partitioned into clicks. And I label these clicks and I label the vertices in the clicks with a pair. One element tells me which click, another element tells me which vertex in the click. And the same graph realizes a caution specter set if it has an orthogonal representation. Now, oh, please don't, don't let us not get confused on this notation here. This is not a tensor product, so this is just, just this pair here, so that each vertex is associated to a vector and labeled by two labels. Um, I would say the graph G realizes a crucial specter set if it has a core representation of dimension D, and there is no a special type of click, a click that uh, uh, contains a vertex for each of the clicks of this partition. So it's not difficult to see that if uh, if the graph G realizes a crucial specter set, then this quantity just defined that, as I said, is equal to the independence number of the graph, is one of the logarithm of k, where k here is the number of clicks. Mm. Okay, so why I wanted to, to introduce
use this because uh, later on I will use uh, these uh, crochet specker sets in order to define some protocol for um, for communicating uh, information between parties that share entanglement in this zero error framework. I'm not sure if this slide is useful just for uh, the ones among us that are not familiar with, uh, with the quantum mechanical uh, uh, setup. I can just skip it immediately if this is fine with you. If, if you like, I can just go through this, otherwise uh, here is just definition of, of um, projective measurements and what quantum channels are. Maybe, maybe it's, do you think it's worth if I spend one minute on this slide? Yeah, maybe. Okay. So, in, uh, what I will be interested in is to work with an hyperspace that is bipartite. So there will be two, uh, two systems, A and B, as usual. And, um, and I will work with density matrices that are up in this type of space. It's just the initial density matrices, essentially. And, um, and this is just a definition of right? the state. We all know what I'm talking about here. How we can say projective measurements. So, so far, standard machinery. And just to remind us what a quantum channel is, is a map that takes density matrices into density matrices. And uh, these uh, operators here, that are called cross operators, are Arisha, and they are a resolution of the identity. So this sum here has to be equal to the identity. So this is the most general expression for a uh, process that transforms a density matrix into a density matrix. And these are the topics that uh, I will consider later on. So now going back to the to the zero error um, setting, I would like to uh, describe a protocol which was introduced in 2010 by Hewitt, uh, Liu, Matthews, and Winter um, to use caution stacked sets to send information. Uh, Possibly by increasing the zero error capacity of a channel. Later on, I will say what the zero error capacity is in the asymptotic limit. So far, I just introduced the single shot case, which is a single use of the channel. Let me go briefly through this protocol. It's not really important that we digest what happens here, but just to give you the flavor of what you can actually do in the zero error uh, framework when you use quantum mechanical resources, which is in time states. Now, let us assume that G is special. It's not just any graph, it's a graph that realizes a cross specter set. So again, it has this orthogonal representation, I mentioned B, it has a, uh, a partition into clicks, K clicks. And the clicks are out of size D. Now, suppose that there is one to send some symbol from my alphabet to Bob. And suppose that there is some uh, uh, shared quantum results, which is this entangled state. And this is the usual setup that we have, for example, in local games, right? Where the two parties share some entangled state. And they can do some operation on this thing. I will consider a channel that is classical. So essentially, there is a mobile token on the form, but they can share a quantum entangled state. And the protocol is, is quite straightforward. That Alice measure the system with respect to, to these bases, which I defined before with a color representation. And of course, what, what you pay is something that is unlimited uh, on the, the vertices in G. And then, given the structure of this state that I'm going to use, the system that Bob has is forced into some specific base state. And of course, this information is conditioned on knowing the, 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 the pair. So Alice sends a classical message to the channel. Bob receives that message. And now, you see that uh, you will be constrained into this situation where I denote the N of QJ, just the neighbor, so the, the neighbors of, of this vertex here in the clique. B 
we know that the state of the system is in certain autonomous states of this type here on the net. And measure basically the states to determine my symbol with certain. Mm. And now let me go to how to use this machinery to show that uh, you can use Gaussian speckled sets to get some gain with respect to what you can do to us. And let you define the entanglement assisted one shot zero capacity in first instance. So, as I said before, the one shot zero capacity is just the independence number of the graph. Here, I allow the two parties to share an entangled state. But the, the, the channel is still classical, so I'm not using a quantum channel. And the entanglement assisted one shot zero capacity is the maximum number of symbols, again, that can transmit without confusion of running on the channel, but the parties share. And I, I will write this quantity as alpha beta. So some type of, of new independence number, a new graph theoretic quantity that I will call it under the system independence number. And uh, by the protocol that I just briefly described, we can say that if G realizes a question specific set, so there is this partition into clicks, then the zero error uh, entanglement assisted capacity with single use of the channel is going to be larger than the number of clicks. So it's going to be larger than the zero error capacity with a single use of the channel. So somehow this quantum mechanical setup allows us to have some gain. Um, now, I just considered the case in which the channel is used only once. Suppose we want to use the channel many times, because we can do coding, right? So I can send words. Classically, the tool that uh, uh, permits us to describe this situation is uh, something called strong graph program. So I said we are working with a graph. Now, what we do is to try to encode words on the vertices of a new graph which is going to be composed by, by a product of the original graph that is the confusability of the graph of the channel. In the confusability graph of the channel each vertex corresponds to a symbol. Now I construct another graph somehow by, by looking at words and each vertex of this new graph will contain a word. Will be associated with the strong product of two graphs G and H is, is a new graph. I denote this product with this box. Where the set of vertices is the Cartesian product of the two set of vertices. And there is an edge in the new graph if and only if one of these conditions is satisfied. So either you have an edge in the first one and the other two vertices in C, or you have a edge in the second one and it's the right thing to say. And I denote in this way a tenfold strong problem. Now, of course, it's not immediately uh, direct to visualize what this object is, but what is important is that if we want to use the channel many times, we know that each word that now we are sending is associated to a vertex of this graph. And here is the indication of zero capacity, which goes back to Shannon 1956. So the zero capacity, sometimes called Shannon capacity, we have say asymptotic zero capacity, of my channel is the uh, independence number taken with respect to this limit. So the largest possible independence number. Here yeah, there is a there is a typo. I'm sorry, yeah, there should be an alpha as well, right? Because you see here is the independent number and it should be going for the independent. Um, and it's natural in some sense, this definition. Why? Because uh, if we use the channel once, we have the independence number of, of the small graph, if we use the channel, the channel twice, we will have the independence number of of the strong graph product of the graph itself, and we want to use the channel as many times as we like in the same topic. So, as a matter of fact, we can see that the 
the zero capacity can be larger than the one shot zero capacity meaning that if we use the channel more than once we can actually send more information and this is uh, simple just consider this graph here C5 which is a pentagon so the dependence number of the pentagon is 2 but then if you look at the dependence number of the, of the graph product of C5 itself it's going to be 5 and which is um, by looking at this definition is going to be larger than the, 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 the uh, one shot zero capacity and, and let me now define some of the main objects of the talk which is the lowest the function so when Shannon defined the zero capacity um, he had trouble to compute it even for, for very simple graphs like the pentagon itself and in fact um, this, um, this fact here is simple to prove because just you have to construct the, the strong graph product of C5 itself but then if you go to the next strong graph product you have 135 vertices and if you want to check the independence number it's going to be 3 so Shannon himself really didn't know whether this um, uh, quantity of okay, there is tight in 1979 Lovas defined this quantity here which is called Lovas the function of Lovas number the definition is as follows you, you take uh, an orthogonal representation of the complement of the graph so we already defined what, what, what an orthogonal representation is so I associate ve ve vectors with the vectors of the graph and I wanted two vectors are orthogonal if the vectors are adjacent here I'm looking at this for the complement of the graph and I, I'm just asking myself to, to real uh, numbers the lowest step function is defined as this quantity where the maximum is taken over some fiducial vector psi can be anything inside the Rd and all orthogonal representations of the complement of the graph um, a very important fact about this quantity is this theorem which goes under the name of sandwich theorem there is a beautiful review on this topic by Knuth, 94, which says that the Lovas theta function is bounded from below by the independence number of the graph, from above by the chromatic number of the complement of the graph. Okay? So we know that these two quantities here are difficult to compute, they are NPR quantities, but a beautiful fact about the Lovas theta function is that is uh, is easy to approximate there is an STP uh, relaxation for that here is just a simple example I look at the pentagon again as before here is my orthogonal representation and uh, it's, it's simple to see that the the function for this specific graph is going to be this quantity now let me tell you why lowest function is useful in our context because first of all it bounds the zero capacity in the asymptotic field not just the one shot case but the, the general uh, quantity and indeed as I was mentioning before this function can be approximated without the precision in time now Sorry, can I ask please please so if I recall it was only proven very recently that actually the capacity of the pen in 79 oh, okay. by, so by Lovas himself that, that introduced the function okay. yes and was it by these sorts of techniques then? exactly yes so and, and it, what, what is interesting here is that uh, yeah in fact some of here is, is uh, okay that's certainly not a proof but these are the tools that we would use in order to prove what is here that the, the Lovas function is multiplicative with respect to the strong product and this is the, the, the key to it right and then yeah, for the second point, uh, there is an STP relaxation. Is, historically, this quantity was very useful because it really fueled the uh, semi definite program. Lots of activity. Um, okay, here is what, what you just mentioned. 
So an example, you look at uh, the pentagon, and, and here is the choice, for example, that you could choose for uh, uh, computing the lowest state function. So a very interesting notion associated with um, this quantity and with uh, zero capacity in general are graphic graphs. So let me recall again the deep number uh, of graph is the kinetic of the largest complete subgraph in G. And the graph is perfect if and only if this uh, uh, equation is like for every subgraph. And interestingly, if a graph is perfect, then all these quantities are the same. So lowest function, independent sound, chromatic number of components, Shannon capacity, and one shot. Uh, zero capacity. And, and perfect graphs are very interesting. Why? Because, of course, since I said that the lowest function can be approximated uh, arbitrarily well in chronometer time, then it means that I can compute the, these two quantities here that are NPR for perfect graphs efficiently. And this is a, a wonderful result. And in fact, it gave, uh, it gave rise to a number of uh, useful ideas that culminate to a uh, characterization of uh, graphs, combinatorial characterization of the graphs in 2002. Now, this is lots of history. Uh, I'll keep going with history before I will tell you about some uh, results that are related to quantum side of the story. One important point is that uh, the OST function is not always tight on the zero capacity. So meaning that there are some graphs for which the, the lowest function is strictly larger than the capacity. And, uh, and how can you prove this? There is another bound that is not equivalent to the lowest function. And of course a bound that is not easy to compute. Sometimes it's called as Emmett's bound still 1979. And this has to do with the minimum rank of safety analysis associated with the graph. I will not go through this, uh, this description here, but just uh, it is worth keeping in mind that the OST function is not tight on the capacity. And possibly here is the main point of the talk. I introduced before some quantity which we call entanglement assisted zero capacity. So using a classical channel, but the parties have access to this quantum state. I can define a version of entanglement assisted zero capacity in the asymptotic limit, exactly as I've done before for the classical capacity, but now the parties share these quantum resources. And we can prove the following result that the lowest function is still an upper bound to this new quantity here. Um, okay, so why this is interesting? Well, as I said, the lowest function is not uh, always tight on the zero capacity, but it may well be that it's tight on the entanglement assisted zero capacity. And in fact, we do not have yet any example that would disprove this conjecture. This is one point. So somehow the lowest function seems to be a quantity that has a physical interpretation, which is the maximum amount of information you can send without errors when you can do everything that nature allows you to do, which is the use of the time states beyond classical, beyond the use of classical channel. And an important point is that we know that this entanglement assisted zero capacity can be strictly larger than the zero capacity. So by using entanglement, you can actually send more information, even in the asymptotic limit. And, uh, and this is uh, due to a result by Jung, Francisca, uh, Matthews, Ozots, and Roy. Uh, I will not go through the proof. Uh, mm, essentially, it used the protocol which I presented before and, um, and some combinatorics 
for some special families of graphs, um, families of graphs for which you can compute the special bound, which is the Hertz bound that I, I point out before, because you want to know that lowest the function is not tight. And in fact, the Hertz bound is smaller than the function, and then you want to show that by using entanglement, you can go, uh, you can you can actually do that. Mm. Okay, so two points. Lowest function is a fundamental quantity for bounding the amount of information that can be sent without error when the two parties share entanglement. And we can conjecture that this is actually equal to this type of capacity. There are not yet counterexamples. This capacity that in fact can be larger than the classical analog. What kind of mathematics do I need to use in order to study uh, communication in the zero error framework when I use quantum resources? Somehow we move away from the graph theoretic uh, context and we generalize it. So, and I would define here something which we call non commutative graph, which is uh, the span of the Krauss operators. Actually, the span of this product of Krauss operators. So why, uh, why you, you end up somehow to justify this, uh, this definition? First of all, this uh, object here, which is an operator subspace, when you look at tensor product, of those, this describe exactly what happened for cancer product channels. And it is a generalization of graphs in what way? The way that you can restrict yourself to the, to the classical case by leaving free certain entries or matrices that describe the graph, that encode the graph. And and this definition here allows you to define certain quantities that go beyond what we defined so far, which is this independence number, uh, and uh, of course the, the entanglement assisted independence number in complete generality. And in particular, you can define the, the maximum number of one shot zero three volume messages for a channel where here you move away from graphs and because the general channels with quantum is the maximum size of a set of orthogonal vectors such that for, for every two labels put on the vectors you end up in something that is orthogonal to the span of this product of cross vectors and this one here is some type of uh, independence number as well, but it doesn't have any classical analog because uh, it, it, it boils down to the, to the standard independence number for graphs, but is more general because it includes also the situation that you have for, for which um, you consider general cross operators, so not, not just, just this. And what is interesting is that this quantity, like the independence number, is anti complete, is QMA complete, which is the quantum analog of. Okay. Of course, once you define this context, which is more general than graphs, then you can try to define a generalization of the lowest function to bound uh, information transfer in this larger framework. <coughs> you can attempt. Okay. First of all, just rewrite the, the lowest function as a maximum with respect to this norm for, for a graph, like. Um, not the, the more general case, but just the standard one. You can look at a sort of naive version of this, just extending to this operator subspace. But uh, this is uh, not, uh, in general, not a technical intensive product, so you need something else. 
So you want to define the space of order emission operator in CN denoted instead CN. And somehow this is like an ideal operator version of the complete graph where everything is connected with everything. And, uh, and a quantum version of the result the function would be a supremum of my operator subspace tensor with the space of all emission operators, which can be written in this way. This is the And uh, if I denote, again, as alpha tilde of S, the time of system independence number of this generalized type of graph, then we can show that the, the quantum version of the Lovasta function still bounds the uh, zero capacity. What is important is that, like the standard version of the Lovasta function, there is a semi-definite program to compute it, so you can approximate it arbitrarily well for the time. This one here is going to be multiplicative with respect to the to the product of operator subspaces, just to develop the line of spot here. And, uh, and again, what is important is that uh, this new generalized version of the OST function allows me to bound from above the zero error capacity of a quantum chunk in the, in the most general way. So now yeah, there are some open problems. So, as pointed out, there are graphs such that the entanglement system, the independence number, is large. Number. Some of these explain why this lowest uh, theta function is not tight. Now here, we can look at S or G as a method. The important point is that this function bounds a quantity that is determined by the use of quantum resources, which, as I said, can be large. For example, can we define a notion of entanglement system perfectness? Can, can we have some type of um, perfect graphs that in this more general framework? And as I was mentioning just now, we saw that there are graphs for which using entanglement allows you to send more information. And here is a problem. Indeed, the, the main projection have actually proved that the, the quantum conversion of the function is indeed equal to the capacity that this restricted to the case of graphs means that the lowest function is indeed the entire the system capacity. Why this should be true? So there are out there entanglement assisted games, like sort games, for which uh, an SDP characterization leads to multiplicativity of the optimal reading probability. Um, just think about CHSH games, for example. There is a result by, by Richard Cleave and Goldberg back in 2006 that says that for CH SH gains, if you do parallel repetitions, you get a multiplicative value for the optical limit probability. So somehow it seems that when you are using everything that, that you can use, like the, the full quantum mechanical power playing the game, then as in this case, there are certain circumstances where you do have multiplicativity. It may be that also, in our case, for uh, when you are not considering uh, at least directly an entanglement system gain, but a framework of information communication, also in this case, there may be multiplicativity. So somehow, this conjecture is not completely uh, insane. Now, I I still have, let's say, 10 minutes, right? And I, I, I won't tell you more, and I would like to go into um, concluding and going towards this non-contextuality in particular, because uh, I know that there are some people here that have done work on non-contextuality uh, recently, and, and using certain ideas that are, in part, uh, parallel to this. But first, let me tell you about uh, this idea of, uh, of quantum chromatic number, which I like, and there, is, uh, there are a few, few token problems uh, related to this. So you have a game where the referees have two players 
some uh, vertices of a graph. And uh, if, uh, so the, the vertices can be either the same or they can be connected. So if the vertices are the same, then the players have to send back a color that has to be the same color. And if the vertices are connected, the, the players have to send back different colors. Um, if you play this game classically, then the minimum number of colors that the players can use in order to answer correctly to the questions of the three is the chromatic number. You know, they get together before, they write down on a piece of paper strategy, they color a graph, they go far away from each other. Of course, they cannot talk when they get started. That's, that's the main point. Um, the chromatic number is the minimum number of colors that they can use. If uh, uh, they are allowed to use some entanglement, then the value of the game is not going to be the chromatic number, but it's going to be something called the quantum chromatic number, which is uh, easy to define, is uh, the minimum dimension of unitary matrices, U1, Un, associated to the rest of the graph, such that this fact here holds for for each uh, for each pair of vertices. So this is the definition that is already, is already quite uh, it's not new really. Um, somehow it's unclear how this quantity, quantum quantity number, relates to other graph theoretic quantities, but as an interesting point recently has been proved that uh, the um, the quantum chromatic number is lower bounded by the lower step function. So this object here that appears again in a quantum mechanical framework uh, fits this hierarchy of graph theoretic parameters that is sandwiched between the chromatic number of the complement of the graph and the independent number. And indeed, as I said, lower bounded by the lower step function. And um, this is just as a parenthesis point out that there is an interesting new graph theoretic parameter arising in this quantum framework and uh, it's worth giving a look at this um, for the reason that I, I just pointed out and um, so I mentioned that um, um, so my goal would be to convince you that this quantity uh, lowest function is really useful and it has a <coughs> physical meaning. Another context where this appears is no contextuality. And to, to state this, maybe I should give another talk, really. But uh, just to give you the flavor about uh, what's going on, it's simplest to uh, recall an inequality. Bell type inequality, which is called Kliapsko country Vini Shoglu Shumovsky. You have a pentagon, like the pentagon that I've considered at the beginning of the talk. And questions, yes, no, accept the words of the pentagon. So we all know this framework of, uh, of uh, uh, non contextuality. Just, just to recall, um, for, for neighboring vertices, so you want that these are compatible, meaning that both questions can be jointly asked without mutual disturbance. And when the questions are repeated, the same answer must be obtained. And exclusive. That is, for adjacent vertices, not both questions can be found. And then you ask this maximum number of yes answers that you can give, asking five questions, one for each vertex, to my physical system. I can do any version of the line. Now, if you ask questions, where the answer is 0, 1, yes, no, let's say, to some electric system, the average of the yes answer is beta smaller or equal to. And, and this is essentially in its uh, case, yes, equal to. Now, let's say, physically, it means that we use observers that are computing, compatible and cover exclusive. We, we know this set up very well. And the interesting point is that these inequalities satisfy the end of contextual and variable theory, but violated by quantum mechanics with a value beta QM. 
So now why I wanted to point out this? Because uh, um, I can actually skip this slide, but recall that the maximum violation of this inequality is given by having the state of the system like this basic state here and you can choose a set of permitting format observables defined in this way and if you remember I've shown a slide before when I was talking about the OST function and this reference appeared there as well and what is interesting is that this quantum value is just equal to this sum. And if you remember my definition of as the function, this is just the same. And indeed, and somehow, apologies if I am very quick on this part, but again, just to give the, the flavor of what happens and I believe that it's, it's, it's quite clear just by looking at just by looking at the formulas and having seen what we have seen. So if I give you a graph, it's not difficult to see that uh, the independence number of the graph is the maximum value of ten classical mechanics, and, and in fact, this is the case as well because I said that this is two. And remember that the independence number of the pendulum is two, and. This quantity here is just brutally the definition of the law of the function, which is the maximum value of the time of quantum mechanics. Uh, here is an example, the simplest example. Interesting enough, considering the pentagon, the pentagon is the simplest non perfect graph. So, the simplest graph for which the law of the function is different from the independent number, where simplest means the smallest number of graphs in number of values. Now, if you want to move on quantum mechanics, there are some other theories which maybe do not really describe how nature works, but we can actually define them. And the maximum value of um, of the framework that I've considered is just given by this quantity a quantum fraction of quantum number, which is a again a quantity used in computer optimization. I guess that uh, this is all what I wanted to convince you about is uh, that zero error or quantum information theory is interesting there is lots of interesting mathematics and most of it needs to be explored mm, there are these generalizations of graphs that allow you to move a graph theory in some sense from a purely computer framework into a computer <coughs> framework there are some notions that may have an interesting interpretation in this uh, context, like perfectness, um, which is a very important notion because of, of algorithms, uh, from the algorithmic point of view. And uh, more specifically, I want to convince that the lowest function now enters the realm of uh, quantum mechanics. Um, <coughs> with some interesting observations and results. And it, didn't off it offered a new perspective in, uh, in various aspects of quantum information. For example, non contextuality And zero information theory uh, in the quantum set. And indeed, this helped us to, uh, to better determine the boundary between these different theories in particular allow us to see quantum mechanics indeed as a sort of sandwich theory mm. between this classical uh, framework where, um, where things are hard and like the independence number difficult to compute this more general framework uh, specified by specify the corresponding to general probabilistic theories and like the OSTA function 
satisfy some kind of sandwich theorem, also quantum mechanics can be shown as some kind of sandwich uh, environment. So this is my talk. Thanks. So for um, uh, so if you consider the um, uh, informational transmission, mm, there's not uh, much, I guess. So if you look into this non-contextual framework, and there is all these general probabilistic theories, and lots of things. Has this been particularly under zero error for setting rather than just the arbitrary sort of? This is this is completely restricted to the why, zero why, error itself. Why, why? Because there is this combinatorial uh, you know, perspective, so, so that the, 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 the channel, at least in the first part of the talk, you see, is classic, just just a standard uh, stochastic matrix. So you, you are using a classical channel, but then you say that the resources share some. Well, the the, the, the parties share some, some quantum resources. Uh, um, yeah, well, the zero-error framework allows you to, to, to go into this uh, combinatorial, uh, yes. right? you, you forget about probabilities, you just have uh, one and zero, and uh, you can confuse this with them. Maybe I can ask a question. Sure. So, so you mentioned a lot of this drives on the conjecture, as I understand it, that the lower theta function is actually the same as the, the entanglement mm -hmm. resistor capacity. How strong is the evidence for so that? So, why is it so hard to prove? Yeah. Um, so, as I mentioned, the global function is not tight on the Shannon capacity. So, there are cases uh, uh, where we know that using entanglement allows you to send more information. However, this information is still bounded from above by the global function. So far, we don't have any counterexample where, the, where this gap is not, where, where there is a gap, right? Where the, the quantity is not tight. Mm, now, why should I believe this fact? Right? So is there any, any particular reason? What I was mentioning is the um, multiplicativity of, um, of certain uh, environmental assisted games, where the value of the game is just given some multiplication of, of the value of the game if you play once. So if you play the game many times, the game times just get something that is related to the value of the game if you play once. And, and this multiplicativity is a main point here, for example, and actually for the lowest function itself. So what keeps you from just proving that they are the same? Is there some yeah, something I mean, in the way, you think? I, and then you get a protocol that uh, allows you to achieve the, uh, the upper bound always, or uh, I wouldn't know Further questions, then let's thank Simone again.